Good morning, all. I'm Charles Wilson, Cybersecurity Engineering Technical Fellow at Motional, responsible for cybersecurity development lifecycle practice. Let me begin by thanking the conference session chairs for the opportunity to be today's first speaker. And I hope that everyone here is sufficiently caffeinated. This talk is entitled, There and Back Again, Building a Cybersecurity Development Lifecycle from Scratch to Comply with ISO SAE 21434 and UNR 155. Now, I realize that's a pretty vague title, and it probably leaves a lot of you wondering what I'm going to be speaking about this morning, but I'll try to elaborate as we go. In the automotive industry, we have a lot on our plate with respect to cybersecurity. When I was hired at Motional about four and a half years ago, I was tasked with making sense of these then not quite complete standards and regulations in order to ensure that our product, which is an autonomous vehicle, aka a robo-taxi, could comply with them. When I was looking at what was out there, I thought, well, th this won't take very long. There's probably a lot of really good work that's been done, and it's all well known, and I'll be done in about six months or so. Well, here I am, four and a half years later, and I think I'm starting to get a pretty good handle on it. So let's look at the AVCDL, where it came from, what it does, how it manages to achieve the goals of sound cybersecurity engineering and compliance. First, let's talk about the standards and regulations. Here's the current stack of standards and regulations that form the ecosystem we live in. At its foundation, we have ISO 9000 and its kin, which establish our QMS, that thing that allows us to track all the other stuff we do. Above that, we have the dual SDLC for systems and software, ISO 15288 and 12207 respectively. And then probably the thing we fixate most on is ISO SAE 21434, along with its corresponding regulation UNR 155, which covers cybersecurity management systems. Above that, we have ISO 24089 and UNR 156, dealing with software update management systems. As a note, the harmonization between these two has finally been completed and should be in the interpretation document for R156 in the next several months. Sitting on top of all that, we have R157, which is the Auto Lane Keeping System, or ALCS. Finally, out in the future, we have the ARIES proposal for ADS from the EU. Now, the UN is beginning to look at creating the regulation that will probably lean into this work. But that's not everything that's out there. We don't just take a regulation or a standard and say, let's create a checklist and just do those things, and then we'll have something which is cyber secure. We need to create a set of procedures which support each other and allow us to create a compliant product with sound cybersecurity. With this goal in mind, I went back to some base documents. These include the aforementioned ISO SAE 21434 and UNR 155, and also include things like ISO 26262, since we're doing cybersecurity in pursuit of safety. On the other side of the house is the long-standing work done by Microsoft in the early 2000s on the security development lifecycle. Between these two, we have the work that's been done by NIST in the area of cybersecurity workforce roles and responsibilities, called NCWF. And also from NIST is a compendium of best practices documents called the SSDF. And I took all of these and looked at them and said, it's like, Great, there are all of these things that we have. And after reviewing them, I recognize that there needs to be a way 
to establish a common basis for talking about the different phases of activities that exist. Here we can see that we've got 15288, 12207, 26262, and 21434, what they talk about and how they chunk up their various activities. You'll notice that although these standards build upon each other, they don't quite line up. Mostly they do, but not sufficiently. One of the first things I did was to create this, which is phase harmonization that establishes eight life cycle phases and two process sets, organization and supplier. The life cycle phases is where the main focus of the AVCDL was. You'll notice that there are things, shown in purple, that don't quite align neatly. In the end, these were divided, but that's something that I felt we could cope with. Here we can see what happens when you take all of these different sources and you try to determine how they speak to the product development life cycle. As you can see, the Microsoft SDL, shown at the bottom, is pretty much a one-to-one -one in terms of how we're dividing things. Above the MS SDL, the SSDF from NIST, as well as 26262, apply over fairly broad areas. Then there's 21434, which is just a nightmare of organization. Way too much caffeine went into the creation of that document, in my view. At this point, all the activities were identified and bucketed. Now what? Since 21434 is the base that we're shooting for, because this is automotive and this is cybersecurity engineering, the next step was to make sure that I was covering all of the requirements in that standard. And that's what you see in this diagram. This is a working document that I use to ensure that I'm covering all the requirements of 21434. Across the top, we have all of the activities and what I would term phase requirements within the AVCDL. On the left side is a list of the 21434 work product requirements. This is great for me, but this isn't overly helpful in terms of communicating to people. So I created this visualization called the AVCDL framework. It breaks down into three main chunks. There's the foundation in blue, which is the stuff that you create once and then use for every product. This includes training, code protection, release integrity, and plans for incident response, decommissioning, threat prioritization, and deployment. The area in green it contains the activities that you do when you're building the individual product, and the ones in yellow are the post-production aspects, those of operations and decommissioning. When you look at how this breaks down further, you can see that we have two different sets of coverage that we're trying to achieve here. We have the ones that address design deficiencies and those that address implementation defects. Now, 21434 doesn't require that we do any of the things that are looking for implementation defects, which is, in my view, really important. 21434 focuses on the fact that you will do a TARA that you do it up front, and at the end, you check it to make sure that you're good. And you're supposed to keep all of this fresh. But here we can see very clearly that there are things we do in the design phase which are intended to catch issues early, and then we have those we do in the implementation phase which are far more tactical. We're doing things like static analysis and dynamic analysis, fuzz testing, and secure code reviews. You may have noticed that the distribution of activities has a normal distribution look to it. Well, that's because the implementation phase is where most of the cybersecurity engineering is being done. 
That's where we're applying cryptography and ensuring that you don't compromise security through poor software development practices. Since the AVCDL doesn't prescribe a particular implementation methodology, an elaboration document was created to help those who use the V model understand how it relates to the AVCDL. On the left is a portion of a diagram showing how particular artifacts created in earlier stages are verified in later stages. In this example from the document, we can see that the threat modeling and attack surface analysis reports created in the design phase are later reviewed in the verification phase. Additionally, you can see how particular downstream activities rely on various upstream activities. Now, there are those individuals who see linear implementation methodologies as at best antiquated and at worst evil. They look at the AVCDL framework and say, you know that that's waterfowl and we're agile. And my answer to that is that I write in English using a left to right script and the best way to put all of this data together in a compressed form is to use this rectilinear format. Even though the AVCDL goes to great pains to explain that it does not prescribe a particular implementation methodology, some people aren't moved until you can show them the data in a form they're comfortable with. This is what the AVCDL framework looks like when you visualize it in a cyclic view. As with the V model, aspects of cyclic implementation methodology are addressed in an elaboration document. As we can see in the diagram on the left, the implementation phase has feedback which channels through the threat prioritization process and eventually into the issue tracking system. This feedback can return to the implementation phase directly or to the design or the requirements phases. Although we generally have forward progress cyclically, retrograde events may be forced when issues arise. It's important to note that adoption of cyclic implementation methodology in a large-scale system subject to regulatory constraints requires that the system be decomposed to a level of granularity which more readily allows for this type of feedback. When creating safety-critical cyber-physical systems, we need to be able to establish traceability. This portion of the product dependency diagram shows how all the AVCDL products can be traced back to fundamentals such as the cybersecurity goals. In practice, we should start with goals and let them drive the various activities which support them. As you can imagine, the AVCDL took a lot of time to put together. It also evolved over time. At times, it seemed that every answer brought up multiple new questions. Let's look at some of the patterns that have come up repeatedly in the AVCDL. Here we see a typical phase requirement as shown from the AVCDL primary document. Every phase requirement identifies both the responsible group and the role within that group. RASIC information is provided for possible participating groups. Training is indicated, as are the requirements dependencies, both within the AVCDL and also specific needs from other groups. A list of products and their documents is provided. And finally, how the requirement fulfills various standards and regulations. Within each of the AVCDL secondary documents, the process workflows are decomposed into a series of activities. In this case, we're looking at threat modeling. Within the threat modeling process, we undertake three individual activities, threat model creation, threat model analysis, and threat model triage. As you can see, we call out the actors that are participating, the inputs, and the outputs. Additionally, we have optional feedback that may lead to updating the threat model itself. And once the triaging activity is complete, the final artifact is fed into the threat ranking process. Each document in the AVCDL has a set of references, so it's not just an opinion-based creation. I encourage everyone to review these references in order to better understand 
the reasoning behind the choices that were made in the creation of these documents. As you might imagine, this sounds like a lot of stuff, and in fact it is. There's a primary document, there are about 70 secondary documents, there are 10 blog posts that describe things at a very high level so management can get a good overview of things, and there are worksheets and templates for various activities. Here's the elephant in the room, if you will. Supply chain. Now, it's great if you're doing cybersecurity engineering, but in something as complex as a modern vehicle, it's doubtful that you'll be the only participant in your supply chain. Early on, it became obvious that supply chain needed to be addressed directly. And how do we integrate cybersecurity into supplier selection? This question drove the creation of three inputs to the process. Those were self-reported cybersecurity maturity, a manufacturer's disclosure statement, and a mapping between supplier processes and the AVCDL processes. These are used to drive the requirements and the cybersecurity interface agreement, the latter informing the SLA, TARA, and the SBOM. The supply chain material has an ecosystem of guidance documents to be able to handle all the questions that come up. Now you're really thinking, wow, that's a lot. What do we do with all this? There's this thing called training, because everyone involved in cybersecurity engineering needs to be both qualified and trained. In order to do that, we had to establish a training path. Here you see the main training path for the AVCDL. The items in green are the trainings that I've already created. The supply chain has its own training path. It's smaller because the anticipation is that they're doing their own thing, but you need to ensure that they have these bits in common because if you need to do a CIA, you want to do so in a consistent way, both for the supplier and the customer. Now, this is great, but why should I care? Well, we care because we have a need for assessment. The first type of assessment mentioned earlier is self-measured maturity. We apply it to our own organization in order to be able to show how we're continually improving. Here's a spreadsheet that lists all of the AVCDL phase requirements with an SEI CMM level for each. The second type of assessment is external. The AVCDL is, to my knowledge, the only cybersecurity lifecycle which is fully compliant in terms of what it can do for cybersecurity, both with 21434 and R155, and is publicly available. Here are the assessment letters to prove it. I needed two pages for R155 because the list is so long. Please note that this is an assessment, not a certification, because unlike a certification where you tend to do spot checks, the assessment went line by line through both the base and interpretation documents. And the AVCDL provides the fulfillment documents that were used to assess compliance. Assessment took a long time. We had 19 months of discussions with two sued before we were ready to do the 21434 assessment. It took eight months to do that assessment, 14 rounds of back and forth. The time required for R155 was shorter. I mean, it only took six months because we had already gone through the process once and I understood what was going to be needed. If you intend to get a certification and you think you can wait until after you've finished VNV before starting the process, you're probably not going to have a good outcome. Talk to your certification body's service group early and often. Make sure that you know where any holes in your processes are so that you can resolve them. Charles, this is great, but it's too much. We have suppliers that have no security posture. We can't just dump this on them and tell them to just do it all. And I appreciate that. And so 
this issue motivated a way to address the problem, which I call incremental adoption. When you're trying to incrementally adopt, your goal is to achieve security, not to achieve compliance. This is because compliance requires a lot more than security does. And you can't just say, well, I'm going to be compliant and then I'll be secure. If you first get yourself secure, compliance becomes a much easier lift. Here we see an adoption spectrum, which takes us from tactical to strategic application. And it chunks up into five stages. Bare bones, tactical, tracked, managed, and mature. And here's how we decompose the AVCDL phase requirements into those stages. The further you progress from tactical to strategic, the greater the interplay and interdependence there'll be between the various activities and with other groups within the organization. It's far easier to implement the early stage activities and make adjustments to your organization's tooling as you progress. Implementing later stage activities and attempting to backfill the earlier stage ones will lead to a lot of churn should any changes be required, and there probably will be. So what did I learn from all of this? Learn from the past. There's a lot of good work out there. Be systematic and consistent. Other groups expect that they can just come to cybersecurity and we need to be ready with consistent answers. Play well with others. Cybersecurity isn't here to lord over anyone. We're here to support others. Allow realistic amounts of time. Cybersecurity has a cost both in time and resources. Plan for it. And communicate liberally. No one likes surprises. Don't be the source of them. Now that your brain is full, I'll leave you with some homework. First, all those AVCDL trainings I mentioned earlier, they're up on YouTube. You can go there and see them. Second, there's a GitHub site that has all the AVCDL materials. That's both source and distribution forms. It's all Creative Commons so that we can make sure that cybersecurity is available to everyone. Finally, here are two pages of references covering this presentation in case you want to dig deeper there. And with that, I'll open for questions.